It's 10 o'clock. This is Sky News at 10, our top story. Drilling for oil for decades to come. The country's largest untapped oil and gas field is approved for exploitation. It is obscene and reckless, say campaigners, and will extract oil beyond the net zero deadline. But ministers and even some of their opponents back the move. Also tonight, Britain braced for the first major storm of the autumn, which has brought flooding and storm damage to Ireland's southwest coast. The killing that police called every parent's worst nightmare. A 15-year-old girl stabbed to death on her way to school. The fireworks at a wedding which caused a deadly blaze in Iraq, killing at least 100 of the guests. The controversial presenters suspended from their shows after a misogynistic rant on GB News and action by the media watchdog. And her life's work, why one of the causes closest to the Princess of Wales's heart is child's play. And we'll take a first look at tomorrow's front pages. That's coming up in our press preview from 10.30. Hello there, good evening. A week ago, the Prime Minister denied he was watering down Britain's climate targets when he announced we'd me have more time to buy electric cars or change our home heating. Today, the country's biggest oil field development in years was signed off, which the government's energy secretary said would de help deliver the transition to cleaner power. Environmentalists and the Scottish government opposed the decision, though it got backing from one high-profile opposition figure tonight, former Prime Minister Gordon Brown, telling Sky News it's better for the country's oil to come from the North Sea than Saudi Arabia. Well, the Rosebank oil field is located some 80 miles west of the Shetland Islands. Companies led by a Norwegian state oil giant expect it to deliver 325 million barrels, barrels of oil over its lifetime. Our economics and data editor Ed Conway reports. A controversial new chapter of Britain's North Sea story has begun. Far off the Shetland coast in the coming months, as the seasons turn, work will begin to extract crude from the Rosebank oil field. It is a big moment, the biggest new North Sea field in two decades. Oil and gas still provide three quarters of Britain's energy, and the companies drilling Rosebank promise jobs and economic benefits. The announcement today also means that we're committing to inwards investment into the UK. Um, you know, as I said, creating jobs, but also you know, making sure that this is a contribution to energy security and, and you know, the industry as such, and keeping, keeping the supply chain um, also busy for a while to come. For politicians of both parties, this isn't just about the economy, but about security too. The question is whether the oil comes from Saudi Arabia or from another uh, oil producer or whether it comes from the North Sea. And when you look at Britain's uh, uh, balance of payments position, it's far better for the oil to come from the North Sea. But for all the talk about energy security, it's worth just having a look at what the impact of this is going to be. This is UK oil production going off into the future, so towards 2051. Let's add on Rosebank and have a look. You can see it makes a bit of an impact, certainly, but the UK is still going to be a declining basin, reliant on imports from overseas for all of that period. Um, but have a look at this. This is the map of different North Sea installations. You can see, let's have a look. You can see there uh, is Viking, very famous gas field uh, off in the southern bit of the North Sea there. Uh, up north you can see Brent, very famous oil field off to the east of Shetlands. But the interesting thing about Rosebank is, look, it's over here. It's this kind of new frontier. And a lot of people think there may be more discoveries to be found right there. No more oil, no more gas. We don't want a climate crash. But the timing could hardly be more provocative. More oil fields means more carbon emissions. And only 24 hours before Rosebank was approved, the International Energy Agency said no new fields were needed to get to net zero. In other words, it's not just protesters making this point. We have a massive opportunity actually to develop our renewable energy resources and instead we've got the UK government doubling down on fossil fuels, which aside from the fact that our climate simply cannot cope with these massive new oil fields, um, will keep pushing the UK in the wrong direction in terms of our long-term economic prosperity and in terms of the jobs of the future. The North Sea is still declining. Rosebank won't change that. But it is a symbolic moment, a reminder that the path to the energy transition will be bumpy and divisive.
at Conway Sky News. The government's chief advisor on nature told Sky News today, if we don't have a healthy environment, we don't have an economy in the long term. Tony Juniper was speaking after what's believed to be the most comprehensive review of Britain's wildlife ever revealed that the number of species in the UK has declined by almost a fifth in 50 years. Our science correspondent Thomas Moore reports. We have a wonderful margin full of bird seed mix. Martin Lines farms for crop. food but also for nature, giving up ground to wildflowers and planting crops that enrich the soil. He needs fewer chemical sprays and fertilisers as wildlife has returned, a rare oasis in a landscape where, a new report shows, plants and animals have declined by a fifth since 1970. We've seen other species like skylark, lapwings, corn buntings, uh, yellow hammers, uh, and all a whole abundance of other stuff coming back. And that really gives me joy. But we've also seen things like turtle doves that we had here 10 years ago hardly been seen. So we haven't won this battle yet. Conservation specialists have monitored nearly 10,000 species and found that 43% of birds, including the turtle dove, are at risk of being lost in the UK. 31% of amphibians and reptiles, such as the natterjack toad, and the hazel dormouse is among the 26% of land mammals that could disappear. Britain has lost more than half its wild plant and animal species over the last few centuries because of human activity. Shrinking habitats, unsustainable farming practices and now climate change have made the UK one of the most nature-depleted countries on the planet. Climate action has already been delayed by the government, but its chief advisor on nature warned it must stick to its commitments on wildlife. We mustn't see a choice between nature recovery and economic growth. These things have to go forward together. And that's not only because it's important to have a healthy natural environment. The truth is that if we don't have a healthy environment, we don't have an economy long term. The government has vowed to halt nature's decline by the end of the decade. But wildlife groups say the new report shows action has been weak and slow. The public wants to ensure that there is progress, not just to halt what we've lost, but actually to start to put it back and to restore it. And so we need to ensure that we're putting in place the appropriate investments, but also the policies across government and business. But the report says all is not lost. Some species are recovering. And with rapid action, Britain could once again become a green and pleasant land for wildlife. Thomas Moore, Sky News in Cambridgeshire. Weather forecasters have warned that the worst conditions may yet be to come as the first major storm of the autumn batters the British Isles. Storm Agnes brought high winds to the Irish coast earlier today and is now advancing on England, Scotland and Wales. Well, our chief North of England correspondent Greg Milam is in Blackpool tonight and indeed several hours before Agnes abates Greg. So how's it looking? Well, I think those winds have certainly arrived uh, after the, a day of warnings that what we've seen across Ireland, for example, today would, would hit the Lancashire coast, the Cumbria coast, and then head on up into Scotland. It has got very squally and blustery in the last hour or so, and some bands of rain uh, as well. The Coast Guard here told us they were expecting gusts up to 50 miles per hour. That means that the lifeboat station here is closed. They won't be able to put out if anyone should get into trouble, and it is high tide out there uh, right now. And those weather warnings that extend over such a big area of the, the UK continue to be in place and will be in place until 7 o'clock in the morning, so covering large parts of Wales, this part of, uh, of England and up into Scotland with rain warnings for Scotland as well. It's wind warnings elsewhere and the kind of things they're warning of are exactly what we saw in Ireland earlier today where, where these winds peeled the roof back off uh, buildings, they brought down trees and of course with that taking out power lines as well, causing disruption on the roads and the, the railways and the ferries uh, as well and there are several hours more of this due in this part of the country and elsewhere and it's why the Met Office are warning that even though maybe the worst is over for some parts of the UK, anyone driving for example tonight through this needs to be very, very careful and through the nighttime hours. There was a sense really that the intensification of the storm before it hit Ireland meant that it had lost some of its power by the time it made its way across Wales and now across England as well. But certainly these winds are strong and potentially damaging and potentially very dangerous to anyone in their path. Live there in a very windy Blackpool. Thank you.
Police are tonight holding a 17-year-old boy after the stabbing of a teenage girl on her way to school. A passerby and bus driver tried to save the 15-year-old's life at the scene in Croydon in South London. The Metropolitan Police said the attack was every parent's worst nightmare. Rachel Venables reports now from Croydon. This is where they tried to save her. Bandages, surgical gloves and medical kits strewn on the ground where a 15-year-old girl was stabbed to death. I turned around I could see that someone was trying to resuscitate her over there. There were loads of people that had just come off of the bus and then I think two of the, um, the girl's friends came out and they were trying to rush over towards the body. So myself and a few of the other people tried to hold her back and just say, look, let them try and help your friend. And she was just screaming, is my friend dead? And saying, it's my best friend. She'd been on her way to school at the private old palace of John Whitgifts, where she was a pupil. Police later arrested a teenage boy who they think knew her. Within 75 minutes of the incident happening, a 17-year-old boy was arrested in New Addington. He remains in custody and will be questioned by detectives. Next words of condolence from the local MP. We all hold our children close and our community will take time to grieve, but for today, we are just thinking of this young girl and her family. I'm so sorry. Sadly, London is no stranger to teenage stabbings, though police have worked hard to bring down the number of fatalities in recent years. But what happened here today will remind people it is still a huge problem. With the death of such a young girl on her way to school, terrifying local people. And this is a community which anti-knife crime campaigners have worked for years now to make safer. We were dubbed historically as the crime capital of London and um, 22 months, no teenage murder. The shock is that it's a young girl and it's about young girls now feeling safe, that they can travel through the streets of Croydon. We're confident that they can. But it's to reassure young women that we are on it. We are going to be working with teenagers as much teenagers as possible. As police continued to hunt for evidence and question the suspect, the Met Commissioner came to speak to officers. All the while, we know a family now grieves for the tragic loss of their 15-year-old girl. Rachel Venables, Sky News, Croydon. The media regulator Ofcom needs to take a look at the behaviour of two presenters on the Channel GB News, a cabinet minister told Sky News tonight. Michelle Donnellan was speaking after the channel suspended Lawrence Fox and Dan Wooten after a misogynistic rant against a political reporter. Katie Spencer has this report and a warning it includes some of those offensive remarks. Um, show me a single self-respecting man that would like to climb into bed with that woman, ever. It was seemingly the straw that broke the camel's back, even for a channel that prides itself on its anti-woke agenda. Self-styled provocateur come conspiracy theorist Lawrence Fox, unchallenged as he embarked on a deeply misogynistic rant about a rival female journalist to fellow presenter Dan Wooten in an exchange which would ultimately see both men suspended which saw Fox go on to say, that little woman has been spoon-fed oppression, and finished by saying feminist 4.0, they're pathetic and embarrassing. Who'd want to shag that? Political reporter Ava Evans, the target of his rant, disgusted at Fox, but saying those who put him on air have questions to answer. This is actually nothing to do with me. No. This is, this is, this is a network problem. This is a presenter-guest gallery production issue that is nothing to do with me. I just so happen to be the person they're talking about. Yeah. But I'm not in the conversation. I wasn't present for it. No. I didn't ask. I wasn't given a comment, right to reply, anything. It's not to do with me. Fox, whilst refusing to apologise, seemingly determined to take others down with him, screenshotting one message which showed Wooten had enjoyed their banter and another he'd sent a producer briefing them beforehand that he'd be saying things like, what man would ever want a relationship with a woman like Evans? During its relatively short existence, rarely has this right-leaning broadcaster been one to say sorry. But on this occasion, it has apologised. And while Ofcom has said it's examining complaints on this, in truth, the media regulator has struggled to deal with how the channel is pushing television regulation in this country to its very limits. Currently, GB News is subject to 11 active Ofcom investigations. 
Right. Ofcom has very limited powers of intervention. Uh, you know, the GB News holds a broadcasting license. You know, it's going to take an awful lot for that license to be removed uh, from the hands of GB News. All Ofcom does is says, it says, we've investigated, you have broken the broadcasting code, uh, please don't do it again. While four of those investigations relate to the impartiality of several conservative politicians who appear as presenters, ministers even keen to condemn the comments. This is two individuals that have um, completely uh, spoken in an unacceptable and disgraceful way. Yes, we need to look at exactly how did this, this happen, but this is an isolated incident. GB News have acted swiftly and quickly, and I, I praise them and commend them for doing that. The focus now on those who pay Fox and Wooten's wages, both hired for their willingness to prod the bear, suspended by the channel, but crucially not sacked. Katie Spencer, Sky News. More than 100 people have died at a wedding in Iraq after a fire which started while the bride and groom danced. The building's ceiling ignited after fireworks were released. The bride, Hanin, and groom, Revan, survived. Today, he attended the funerals of some of those killed. Well, the wedding was in Nineveh, a predominantly Christian area, around 200 miles northwest of the capital, Baghdad. Our correspondent, Adam Parsons, is in northern Iraq tonight. Adam. Yeah, well, we're in Erbil, which is, of course, the administrative capital of the Kurdistan region. Uh, and the fire happened right on the border between this semi-autonomous region uh, and Iraq. So it has touched both these communities and it has huge symbolic and, I think, political value. Because this is near Mosul, uh, which, of course, was uh, was a city that was devastated four years ago by a ferry disaster that killed a hundred people uh, and led to huge calls for there to be reform and uh, for the government to do more but also the town the christian town where this fire happened was ransacked and in some places raised to the ground by islamic state uh, a community that has tried to recover and which today suffered another devastating blow this is the moment the fire started as flares around the dance floor set the roof alight. There were hundreds of people inside the wedding hall when burning pieces of the ceiling started falling down on top of them. The fire took hold very quickly, trapping many inside. There were only three exits to this building and eyewitnesses reported a stampede as guests ran to escape. This was filmed shortly before the fire started, a video of the bride and groom enjoying their first moments of marriage. They've been named as Hanin Riaz and Revan Isho. They survived, but were treated in hospital. Revan was at some of the funerals this afternoon, clearly distraught by what had happened at his wedding and at the loss of so many friends and family. This has never happened before. It's a disaster. There wasn't a family where someone didn't die. Not a single family. One, two, three or more. Some families lost ten people. Investigators have reportedly said that the wedding hall was built out of highly combustible materials that violated Iraqi building regulations. Ten administrators of the wedding venue have been arrested, including its owner. Iraq's Prime Minister has ordered an investigation into the fire and asked his government to provide all the help that's needed. As the first of the dead were buried, many more were fighting for their lives in hospital tonight, some with very severe burns. Authorities have warned that the number of dead could still rise further. Well, this isn't just a human catastrophe. It will have huge political ramifications. The Iraqi prime minister has made a great store of cleaning up in corruption and making his country safer. And around the world, people have seen this fire and in this country, they are saying, why hasn't more been done? And four years on from a ferry disaster, why is this region once again having to cope with an enormous toll of human loss of life, devastation, and misery. Adam in Erbil, thank you.
Scotland has the highest level of drug-related deaths in Europe, and today the authorities have a new weapon in the attempt to reduce that number. The country's first drug consumption room, in which users can take illegal substances without being arrested, got approval. It has faced opposition, notably from the Westminster government. Our Scotland correspondent, Conor Gillis, reports now from Glasgow. So this is the injecting area. That's in this corner of Europe's drugs death capital, a controversial change is coming. The idea of a safer drug consumption room is people bring their own drugs that they've purchased from wherever. Um, they'll bring them along to a safe environment. It's got like healthcare staff like this. We'll have booths like this. There would be about eight booths. Scotland has been gripped in a sustained cycle of death for years, a relentless crisis of lives lost with few successful solutions. I've been home with all my life. People like 31-year-old Nathan think dealers will take advantage. Possible. The word safe can be put in front of you. If you owe me money and you take the drugs, right, and you have to go to the safe consumption room, how do you think I've got to find you? Something rejected by bosses who've been watching models in European cities. And whilst it's an entirely reasonable anxiety, it's actually found not to be the case um, in a number of places across the globe um, that safer drug consumption facilities have been operating. But it is our intention to work with Police Scotland as one of our key partners. This idea was first floated here in Glasgow back in 2016, but political stalemate stunted progress, with the Home Office initially rejecting those plans. Since then, there have been five Prime Ministers, two Scottish First Ministers, and more than 7,000 people killed. It wasn't until senior Scottish prosecutors recently ruled it would not be in the public interest to take addicts to court that paved the way for this. We think it's a very important component of trying to engage a group of people who aren't yet engaged fully in harm reduction and, and uh, treatment services. Police support the plans but insist blatant crimes will still be tackled. Could that spell trouble in a project never seen before in the UK? Conor Gillis, Sky News, Glasgow. A US soldier who crossed from South to North Korea in July is back in US custody after being expelled by Pyongyang. The North Korean news agency KCNA reported that Travis King had fled to the country because of what it called inhumane treatment and racial discrimination. Now, we've reported before on Sky News at 10 on the so-called ghost children, thousands of them, who miss a significant proportion of their time in school. A report by MPs today found there'd been no significant improvement in reducing those numbers. And Labour's Shadow Education Secretary told us that if her party wins power, they would reset the relationship between schools and families. Our People in Politics correspondent Nick Martin reports from one school in Barrow and Furness, which is attempting to tackle the problem. I felt like I was just one of the, uh, like, non-smart kids of school. And I thought I was just useless. For these school children, speaking openly can feel like a mountain to climb. Don't really do anything social. No. So I normally just stay in my room most of the time. Yeah. We've been allowed into these special sessions designed to get to the heart of how children feel about their mental health and how it impacts their education. Other people target little things about you that they think will get you down and they do it on purpose and that really stops me from getting into school sometimes. Yeah. Because I've been a target of that a lot. This pilot, run in conjunction with Westmoreland and Furness Council, Furness Academy and the charity Family Action, has improved attendance for all of these children, but sessions like these are rare. Seeing this kind of session up close really hits home the amount of work that has to be done to tackle what is a national crisis in low attendance. This is intensive, it's bespoke, but there are now calls for the government to support more projects like this one to roll out on a national scale. A report by an influential committee of cross-party MPs is critical of the government's efforts to drive down absence rates. Mental health support for pupils, they said, was grossly inadequate. And crucially, there has been no significant improvement in the speed and scale of reducing absence. With an eye on the general election, 
Labour is promising to fix the problem. I'm determined that if Labour wins the election and if I'm Secretary of State for Education, that Labour government, that we will tackle this problem. We will work with schools, we will work with families to make it happen and we'll reset that relationship that is just breaking down between schools and families but also between government and schools. Lindsay Stanway has taught here at Furness Academy for 28 years. How worried are you about the lost learning that's going on? Really worried. So the kids that were that struggled through COVID, you're trying to pick up the uh, um, improve their resilience. You're trying to improve their social skills. You're trying to do catch up on maths and English that they've missed. And if we don't do something quickly, it's going to become the new norm, and that's not going to be good for anybody. So we're going to have a go at creating an affirmation. Do you think this should be done in every school? Yeah, for the people who need it, I think it should definitely be taught. I am smart, I am brave, I am strong, I am proud, I am kind, I am accepting and I am confident. The committee says the government needs to act with more urgency to prevent long-term harm to children. But it's clear that Covid still casts a long shadow over the education of millions of children. Nick Martin, Sky News, Barrow and Furness. Well, finally, promoting the needs of early childhood is the life's work of the Princess of Wales, we're told. And today she visited one centre to help young children and parents in Kent. She showed a genuine interest, my mother said, in the support being offered, as our Royal Correspondent Laura Bondock reports. <laughs> if there's one thing the Princess of Wales wants to talk about, it's the early years. Here in Kent, Kate lending a hand and meeting parents whose children have extra needs. This sensory session supports them. Hard to believe, but when three-year-old Beatrice started coming, she wouldn't even walk through the door. There's no stopping her now, and Kate keen to hear how the sessions have helped. I think there is a genuine interest as well. I feel that when you're even talking to her and she's asking those questions, she does genuinely care and wants to sort of highlight all of these needs that are in the community. So I think it's really good. And however it can be promoted, it should be. And that's what this visit is all about. The Princess of Wales getting stuck in to support what goes on here. All of the children have developmental delays or difficulties and they're all being helped by what's known as the Portage Service. Council run, it matches families with staff who help day to day. Waiting lists are long and funding tight, so Kate coming means a lot. It's amazing for us because we are a very small service um, because there's, you know, there's, there's only about 2% of the children in this country that have got this level of need, so it's quite hidden. So I think for her to be here and to work with us and to showcase it is really important for us. By building a supportive, nurturing... Back in January, Kate launched Shaping Us, her big push to promote early childhood. It takes her close to politics and policy, but we're told remains her life's work. Healthy, happy children. And to that, expect more of this as she tries to change the way we see the early years. Laura Bundock, Sky News. Sitting born. Well, that was Sky News at 10. Coming up, we'll take a first look at tomorrow's newspapers in the press preview. Tonight, we're joined by the uh, Daily Mirror's associate editor, Kevin Maguire, and the Daily Mail's Whitehall editor, Claire Ellicott. Welcome to both of you. Uh, certainly among the stories we will be discussing, this on the front page of The Eye, which says that Labour has U-turned on its plans to axe private schools' charity status. Plenty more on that and the other stories when we're back.
more This Is Sky News in just a moment. The press preview, a first look at what is on the front pages. First, though, a reminder of our top stories this evening. And the former Prime Minister Gordon Brown has told Sky News he'd prefer new oil and gas to come from the North Sea rather than from Saudi Arabia after the government approved a licence for the Rosebank oil field near Shetland. Severe weather warnings will remain in place overnight after Storm Agnes brought gusts of up to 70 miles an hour to Western Ireland, as well as heavy rain in Scotland and parts of northwest England. And police have arrested a 17-year-old boy after a 15-year-old schoolgirl was stabbed to death during the morning rush hour in Croydon in South London on her way to school. Well, hello, they are watching the press preview, a first look at what is on the front pages. Time then to see what's making the headlines with the Daily Mirror's associate editor, Kevin Maguire, and the Daily Mail's Whitehall editor, Claire Ellicott. Great to see both of you. Good um, Front pages then, as ever, let's kick off, shall we, with the Metro. The murder of a 15-year-old girl stabbed to death in Croydon covers the Metro's front page. The headline, Machete Revenge on Buster School. The Daily Mirror, too, with that lead, every parent's nightmare, the paper says. And the Daily Mail, the headline, stabbed to death in her uniform on the way to school. The Eye is reporting that Labour has dropped its pledge to remove charity status from some independent schools following concerns of a legal challenge to the policy. Meanwhile, The Guardian carries the story that HMRC is investigating the tax affairs of one of the Tory party's largest donors. The Telegraph leading with the continuing tensions in the Metropolitan Police as a firearms officer faces a gross misconduct hearing. The Times reports that Downing Street has authorised the Home Secretary to float the prospect of the UK leaving the European Convention on Human Rights. According to the FT, the Financial Conduct Authority is to hold a large-scale review of private market valuations. And the Daily Star reports that scientists have discovered a way to regrow teeth. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite good news. Anyway, uh, scan that if QR true. code. <laughs> if true, I'm sure it will be. I drive home and find these stories are. Anyway, um, scan the QR code that you'll see on screen during the programme and look for yourself at those front pages while you listen to our guests. So let's head to, uh, to Claire and to Kevin. And Claire, why don't you pick up, actually, with the Daily Mirror, um, knife crime epidemic is how they're framing it, this awful story of a 15-year-old schoolgirl who died on her way to school. Yes, this is a desperately sad story. This is a 15-year-old girl. She was stabbed to death in her uniform, as the male points out. Um, there's some suggestion there was an argument about a bunch of flowers. There was a boy involved. And the male's actually saying here that the, the person who was stabbed was stepping in to protect a friend. Um, all we know is that there was a horrifying knife attack. This girl was meant to be going to her private school down the road in, near Croydon. And um, it was in the morning rush hour. There were, you know, commuters everywhere. Witnesses saw this happen. They were both in their school uniforms. It's a desperately sad story. Met police have said that, you know, this is every parent's worst nightmare. And it is, I think, the 16th violent stabbing in London this year. It's clearly... It clearly is an epidemic, as the mirror says. Um, it's clearly violence is out of hand and it's, it's hard to see what, what can be done about it if people are willing to you know, commit these attacks during the rush hour mm. on a you know, normal school day morning. Yes, we pride ourselves, don't we, that we don't have handguns in this country, yeah. unlike in the States, and yet knife crime is still an issue. And you heard the news conference you know, subsequent to this. The, the despair of the community that these sorts of attacks are happening, Kevin. No, no absolutely, because it will have... You know, somebody's lost their life, a family is mourning... Uh, Friends, neighbours, schoolmates, all will be traumatised. Teachers, it, it ripples right through. And that's it, why it's leading three newspapers, the matter, you know, the matter of the Mirror and the Mail. Maybe the sun we haven't seen the front of the sun yet, possibly there. But it's, you know, we don't know all the details because, for instance, the Metro say it's a machete, the Mail says it was uh, a blade as big as a sword, but we all know it's been a fatal stabbing. Uh, a boy 17 has been arrested, a girl 15 is now dead, killed on her way to, to school. It's absolutely appalling. How do you stop it? The, you know, the number of deaths isn't always constant. It comes in waves at some time. You've just got to, you know, each, each, each one will be individual, but will also be collective reasons, and it's just never give up trying to stop this happening. 
Yeah, I mean, possibly a knife amnesty. We've seen them, haven't we, sometimes? Yeah. But, uh, you know, very, you know, very, very uh, distressing for family, friends, community, um, mm. uh, in, in uh, you know, just an awful yeah, incident. Yeah, dreadful. Um, let's move on to the Metro. Inside pages of it, in fact, this massive untapped area of the North Sea, given the go-ahead. Um, huge reaction to this then, Claire. Yes, yeah, so it's quite a controversial thing to do because it's the UK's largest untapped oil field. There's 350 million gallons of, apparently of oil in there. And um, what's really, really interesting about it is that it's Rishi Sunak saying, you know, we want to make sure this country has an independent energy supply, but it's driven climate change campaigners mad because they're like, we, we shouldn't be digging for fossil fuels um, at a time when, you know, we're fighting to meet net zero targets. But Rishi Sunak's already started with this because he's ditched a lot of green pledges that had been, you know, Tory pledges before this. So it's really, really interesting. Um, they think they're going to start drilling in a couple of years and that it could provide about 8% of the UK's energy. But what's really interesting about it is that it will be run by a company um, that's based in Norway and it will be, the oil will be sold on the mass but market. But that's how the system works, isn't it? Yeah. You know, it will go to energy security, but across northwest Europe. That's how you have to think so, about so it. I, yes. So you actually don't get the oil. It's, it's equivalent. I mean, the way they've it written it... It goes to it's, the market. It's, yeah, it's equivalent to 8%, but it doesn't, it's not your 8%. Yeah. You might have zero benefit from it, other than the government could get taxes on the output, uh, although they're going to get such big tax breaks... They might, they might end up getting three or four billion pounds to develop the field and it benefits Britain very little at all. But Labour's going along with it. Keir Starmer has said he'll honour all licences. Now, it's very interesting because if he said, if we're in power, we win the next election year's time, we won't honour this licence, I suspect it wouldn't go ahead. But he doesn't want to do that because he feels he'd be on the wrong side of the argument. You'd, all, you'd, you'd get a lot of hassle from trade unions. Yes, exactly. Unite and the GMB, but both important to Labour financially and organisationally. You could be on the wrong side of parts of public op op opinion. But you know, the North Sea is almost pumped out. It's yeah. you know, way past its So the costs its of extraction go up and therefore yep. the energy requirements of extraction mm -hmm. go up. Mm -hmm. And how does this, you know, compare, you know, when you look at what's happening, for example, in sea ice in Antarctica? Mm -hmm. Does Rishi Sunak not care about climate change? He says he yep. does, but he's pushed it all down the line. What does it mean electorally? What's your best bet? Well, you can see that this is a clear strategy in the run-up to the next election. Do you, do you genuinely think that's what it is? I or is it so, that yes. Rishi Sunak doesn't have, you know, such strong feelings about it that Boris Johnson did. I, th I think Rishi Sunak is taking... His argument is that we will meet net zero at 2050, but we have to take a different route because it's not realistic to get people to replace to replace their gas boilers with heat pumps at a cost of five, ten, fifteen thousand pounds, which is what they do cost at the moment. It's not realistic to say to people you have to buy a new car and you know you're not going to be able to buy a petrol or diesel mm. car in five years when the EU is you know five years later than that. His view is that you have to do these mm. things practically, and there is a bit of a backlash across Europe because loads of other countries have had a backlash from their populations and there's a rise of kind of anti-climate um, parties who don't want any of these changes to happen. So Rishi Sunak's argument is that the way to preserve net zero is to make sure this stuff is done properly. Yeah, yeah. the way to preserve it is to use more fossil fuels. <laughs> I mean, but it's, it's interesting, Gordon Brown saying to Sky, look, yeah. uh, I'd, ra I'd rather we had it from the North, you know, this fuel from the North Sea rather than Saudi Arabia. I mean, that's quite... A... He's thinking about jobs in <laughs> Scotland. Yeah, yeah as well. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a clever, it's a clever argument, yeah. but, of course, it is just leaving us more dependent on on these fossil fuels for longer. That's what it really does. Mm. OK, let's go to um, something that the eye has been covering all week, which is Labour's policy on, on uh, private schools, about VAT on fees and on their charitable status. Kevin, why don't you do this one for us? It looks like one part has been rowed back on. Yeah, the charitable status. I, d I thought they dropped this some time ago. The, and the only reason uh, is, uh, I realise, Keir Starmer the leader, and Bridget Phillips and the Education Secretary had just stopped talking uh, about removing charitable status for months. I just assumed there must have been an announcement at some point <laughs> and I'd missed it, but it seems they haven't. They've just sort of tried to tiptoe uh, away from it. So the, the money, 1.7 billion will go on fees, 20%. Uh, private schools say loads will close, you know, their lobby group, but then the Institute of Fiscal Studies came out with a report saying actually that wouldn't be the case of, uh, at, at all, but Labour's going to plan to use the money to employ an extra six and a half thousand 
teachers. Sounds a lot, really, but given there's more than 20,000 state schools, that's kind of, you know, a day and a half <laughs> uh, new teacher for each if you, uh, if you spread them around. But Labour, Labour have very few tax pledges, very, very few. I think non-DOM private schools... And it doesn't raise a lot, does schools. it? That's the, I mean, no, that's the point. No, but, but they're, I think they're sending out a powerful signal. There's only 7% of kids in, in uh, private schools, 93% in state schools. And it does seem ridiculous, that Eton is kind of uh, treated in such a way. I mean, it's still going to be allowed to be a, a charity, but you don't pay VAT on school fees. You somehow get a 20% tax break. I mean, come on. Mm. It's not a okay. good use of public money. Yeah, I mean, you know, where, what's the positioning for, uh, for your paper on this one, for example? Well, I think, you know, this is clearly... What, what seems to have happened, and I hear Kevin, but none of it, there wasn't an announcement. No, no. no. <laughs> none of us no. knew that mm. they decided to drop this charitable yeah. status thing. Yeah. In fact, today they were briefing that, you know, we, we, so we're not going to treat schools, these private schools as charities. That's been our position for ages. And it took us seconds to find, you know, quotes from Keir Starmer <laughs> and Bridget Phillipson <laughs> saying that, you know, they were planning this. So it clearly is a position change they've decided finally that they're actually going to... Which is a legal that. challenge, they suggested, yeah? They get yes. mad in the courts and all that. Well, that well, well, sounds convenient to me. It sounds more like they're uh, going a bit soft on, on these private schools so when they're accused of class war, they can just say, we've got, we've got a financial case here because we're going to employ the 6,500 teachers, but we're not uh, going to go f uh, full out for you. If, if, they if they say they made an announcement, they can just show us where it was. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's, 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 it's easy. I mean, look, I'm, I'm old enough so to... Re for the overnight yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm old enough to remember where Keir Starmer uh, supported renationalising water. <laughs> 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 Going back into the that European back, Union. Too, too. I mean, um, what, defending free movement. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go to the Daily Telegraph, shall we? Only half of trainee GPs go into the NHS full-time, which is, I mean, this long suggestion about the fact they're going elsewhere, Claire. Yeah, this story is actually quite interesting. It's based on um, figures um, from the Nuffield Trust, which show that while 2,837 medical graduates start off their training, um, they only only half of those become full-time GPs who join the health service. It's not quite clear where they go or for what reason. Well, do reasons. they continue their training? Well, this is it. This it seems to it seems to suggest that they they don't. They then don't go to fulfil these GP training posts. It's um, there's you know a suggestion that some go overseas and maybe you know they carry on their carry on their training there. But it's not it's not really clear what they mean. But I think um, there is clearly a crisis in the NHS. There are uh, there's a lack of GPs or a lack of um, certain types of doctors. There's a lack of basically everyone. So um, there, there is a huge problem yeah. there. And um, and I think they've started talking about expanding the number of places for doctors and nurses to train in Britain. Well, I thought they the kept moment. the cap, actually. They, the cap got loosened yeah. during COVID, but the cap's been kept. Yeah, but if you're, if you're getting all these people training, but they're leaving, and they've run up, they've run up huge student debts, mm. but for whatever reason, yeah, they're, right. they're quitting. It is it's like, it's like it's running a bath with the, with the plug out. So you're putting all these people in, but then they're just draining away. And you're never really going to improve the NHS uh, without extra GPs and other medical staff and, and beds. But the Health Foundation has quoted, which uh, is a think tank quote in the Telegraph here, saying um, 4,200 GPs short in England. Mm. Uh, that's, it's gonna, if you haven't got those GPs who are the gateway into the NHS, you're going to have more and more people go to A&E, which is a huge yeah. problem then at, at, at A&E. Or not getting treated and then waiting yeah, too long to be it's, seen. Yeah. It's a, well, the it's, classic issue we've seen. <laughs> it, it, it is. GPs are absolutely crucial, but they, I think the pressure is on them. They don't feel particularly valued and they're overburdened, not appreciated. If they're quitting, we're, we are. We're just we're stuffed, mm. basically. There is a suggestion Sorry, a lot of technical them are going... term, I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It says we're short of everything and you say we're stuffed. Like, <laughs> yeah, 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 happy <laughs> days. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very quickly, yes. Yeah. You're Sorry, there's, there's a suggestion. There's a suggestion that a lot of them going into private um, yeah. companies like Bupa and um, that. Well, the rise of the private GP, we've seen it, haven't we? Yeah. Lots more still to come, including uh, two GB News presenters are suspended after one doesn't stop the other from going on a misogynist rant. We will discuss that in just a moment.
Claire Thomas-Peter and I'm Sky's climate change correspondent. The UK is a world leader in wind power. Basin rainforest, which is such an important ecosystem, it's known as the lungs of Africa. We aim to be the best and most trusted place for news. She doesn't really enjoy speaking to the press, and it wasn't clear right up until the last moment that she was going to sit down with me. I might be just very naive, but I do believe that change is possible, otherwise, we wouldn't be climate activists. I'm confident for the last 30 years we have known how bad it is. I'm not here to apologize, but I'm here to fight for the next step. You can see just the piles and piles of stuff. These the sofas and people's desks and children's books. And you can see inside this home here, people trying to, uh, to sort out their home. It's just been devastating. I think everything's at stake. The future of our planet, the future of the beauty around us, the future of you and me. Well, welcome back. You are watching the press preview with me once again, Kev McGuire and Claire Ellicott. Welcome back mm. to both of you. Um, so let's get to GB News. It is on page four of the Metro. GB News suspends the duo over uh, actor Fox's sexist rant about journalists. Kevin. Yes, I think this was always going to happen on this this channel because uh, it's, it's just running out of control and people are being encouraged to be ever more outrageous in the name of free speech when it's hate speech. And this, of course, is, is Lawrence Fox, who heads the Reclaim Party, a very small... Uh, I suppose it's anti-woke, isn't it? That's what, that's what drives it, par uh, party. Um, talking about Ava uh, Evans, a, uh, a report in the most derogatory terms, you know, possibly, I mean, in... in in short, saying you know, no one would ever sleep with her, which is absolutely crazy and a vile thing to say. And Dan Wooden, the presenter, didn't didn't check him, didn't pull him up. Oh, look, we have, we have debates here, and I, I'll say my <laughs> things, and you'll jump in in the interest of fairness or say, hang on, they're not here to answer. I mean, if you know this, if Lawrence Fox had somehow been sitting here and had said that, you'd have been straight in uh, and tore him apart. Uh, as any any present a worth his or her salt would, but Dan Wooden didn't. So, so and then Fox gets suspended and he's taken Wooden down. And it's, it's revolutions devour their children. Uh, the culture warriors are now fighting each other because Fox is trying to take Wooden down by showing he was publicly contrite Wooden, but then he would have been sending emojis kind of a, a yeah. pr approving of what had happened to Fox. Yes, Lawrence Fox revealed all after the event, yes. did they not, that they'd had a laugh about it yeah. anyway, um, even though Dan Wooden had apologised. It was a big problem for GB News, though, because not only Ofcom... Well, why is it, though? Well, well, not, not because of... Right, they've got reputational damage, I think, but they'll be terrified now about Ofcom, because it's a clear, clear breach. But also, Paul Marshall, one of the owners, an incredibly wealthy uh, city slicker, uh, who puts a lot of money into GB News, is also thought to be wanting to buy the Telegraph. Now, you, know, you will have to pass certain tests to buy the Telegraph. I can't imagine, if you're a big investor, you want to be associated with a channel that is peddling this filth. 
Well, what about all those Tory MPs who uh, currently also present for it, not you know, including the deputy chair of the party yeah. as well? You know, would they have been a quiet Mark. phone call too? Do you think to the bosses there or not? Well, what's interesting about GB News is it's quite a new startup. They do have a lot of very good journalists on the mm -hmm. channel, yeah. and they have. You know, they also have a lot of members of the Tory party who must be, um, yeah, wondering at this moment in time whether they continue. But, I, I mean... mean if, if there's a guilty by association thing happening, yeah. then, you know, some people might... There was a lot of GB presenters who, you know, turned on um, what happened last night, to be fair, to yeah. distance themselves. Yeah, and there's, they've, they've been on Twitter today saying, you know, that they decry these comments. And it was particularly vile listening to it because, look, you, you know, Ava Evans just made a point about how you know, she didn't... She, she thought that having a, a minister for men wouldn't be a great idea. And Lawrence Fox... In the context of mental health care, yes. wasn't it? Yeah. And Lawrence Fox then went on to, went to, on to Dan Wooten's show and didn't attack her on that point. He then started this kind of vile rant about how nobody wanted to sleep with her. And Dan Witten laughed along. So the whole thing is, it was very hard to watch. And I think, you know, it's really affected the journalists at the centre of it. It's hard for GB News to defend it, but they have suspended both of the, both of the presenters and Ofcom are now investigating. So I suspect, you know, there will be a conclusion to all of this. And maybe GB News will be able to survive because they, you know, don't continue with the show. I'm only hurrying you because we've got the teeth. Yeah, of course. Oh, the, teeth. the teeth. Yeah. The teeth are on it. <laughs> anyway, a Japanese scientist has found a way to grow new teeth. Hopefully not ones quite like that. But anyway... Isn't that Jürgen Klopp, the Liverpool oh, manager? God. I think... So you've wow, just been insulted. I didn't, I didn't even recognise you. Would you like to apologise to all those? <laughs> I'm uh, really, <laughs> really sorry that I didn't recognise you with all the graphic th words I'm all over the picture. pretty <laughs> certain that's him. <laughs> but I remember he, he just turned up with a new pair of Nashers, or he seemed to have... Uh, Did he go to Japan for them? I don't know. Well, they're there. <laughs> but if you, if, you, if you grow new teeth, I mean, you'd still have to have them fixed, in, oh, wouldn't yeah. you? So yeah. It'd be, just be like falsies. Like dentures, maybe. maybe. Yeah. yeah. Mm, well, I can't um, break you now. Right oh, man. I've got to get to store madness. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin Clare, thank you very much indeed. See you for the, uh, for the lovely turn of weather. <laughs> Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly. The weather, fly, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Well, you probably know if you live in the areas, it will be a very windy night as Storm Magnus moves northwards. There will be further spells of heavy and persistent rain, mainly for uh, parts of Northern Ireland and Scotland. Further south, the strong winds will begin to ease and the skies will clear. A band of squally rain, though, will move into parts of Ireland and the West Isles through the morning again, but much of Britain will remain breezy with sunny spells and just an isolated shower. Quite gusty still, especially for central and northern parts. Outbreaks of showery rain will spread eastwards through the afternoon into western Scotland, Wales and western England, eastern areas remaining mostly dry and bright. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways.